Stanford University. Thanks a lot. I wanted to spend a little bit of time starting off first about uh, some of the challenges of investing for the government, um, and particularly the mission that we had when we established InQtel back in 1999, why we established it. Second thing I want to talk about uh, more specifically is uh, some very specific strategies, whether you're investing on the government side or any other strategic institution. And strategic investing is very different than commercial investing or, or traditional venture investing. Um, on the surface, they may look a lot alike, um, but they have very different ground rules, uh, very different metrics of success, and uh, lots of different pitfalls that you can find yourselves in uh, very quickly if you confuse one with the other. Well, first, let's start off and talk about InQtel in specific. Um, so Inkita was formed in 1999. Uh, most of you read the case study by HBS. It was decided to make it an independent 501c3. Uh, the reason why the CIA, particularly Director of Central Intelligence, wanted it to be a nonprofit rather than an actual government institution was the, for the express purpose of having an organization that can make its own decisions independent of the government. His feelings uh, at that time, at that time the, the director was uh, George Tennant. Um, and George uh, was a Senate staffer for many years back. And he had an advisor who later became the executive director of the CIA named Buzzy Krongard. And Buzzy was a very colorful individual. And Buzz, most, most people remember Buzzy as uh, the last CEO of Alex Brown, which was a big investment banking house on the East Coast. And so Buzzy was whispering in George's ear that the quickest death to any organization is making it a part of the government, right? Because if it was inside the government, it had to follow all the government rules. They had, you know, subject to the thousands of individuals within uh, the government community that suddenly would either want to hijack the mission, kill the mission, uh, or detract from the mission. So by making it independent, uh, it was the view of the director that you can keep the organization pure, particularly if it was uh, going to go off and seek technologies uh, from all of the tech centers around the country, but mainly from Silicon Valley. It had to have a Silicon Valley presence. Right? And so <clears throat> it was really funny. I remember uh, getting asked to, to set up InQtel. And the first thing I said is, it has to be on Sand Hill Road. Right? You, you, you can't play venture capital if you're not in where venture capital is happening. And back in 1999, 99-2000, um, there was over $103 billion being deployed in venture capital as an asset class. And over half of that money had Sand Hill Road addresses on it, right? So uh, they said, oh, great, go out and get some space on Sand Hill Road. And I came back with the CIA, and I said, I got some great space. It's fantastic. You know, it's like, and it's, on, and it's only like the, I think it was like, uh, it was like only $14 a square foot. And they go, wow, that's, so, you know, that's not that bad. That's just a little bit more than, you know, here in, in you know, places in Northern Virginia. And I said, no, that's per month. <laughs> they all stared at me and I said, remember, you guys, it's just like going to a cover. You know, you're going to be in the place. You got to act like one of them. So we got to act like Silicon Valley. So um, we had two primary locations, Silicon Valley and um, also a place in, in Arlington, Virginia. Um, the Arlington mission was slightly different than the uh, Silicon Valley mission. Arlington's mission was, to really understand the agency and understand the mission and how they prosecute their business at the, you know, at the agency, uh, at Langley. And then um, and they spend a lot of time on technology and so solution transfer, which I'll get into in a moment. And Silicon Valley was really mix it up, be like the VCs, act like the VCs, get deals done with the venture capital community. Um, the operation had to be over. Overt, so that's the fancy word for it. it had to be completely pu public and it had to be as transparent as you possibly can make it. First of all, it's the Central Intelligence Agency. I, I try to explain CIA on the West Coast currently means the Culinary Institute of America. 
And uh, the other CIA is not necessarily that appreciated in certain circles on the West Coast. So uh, you better get out there and you better be overt about it because if not, every conspiracy theorist will come out and try to dig down deep and do these interesting connections between what's happening in the valley and what's happening in, in, the, in the beltway. So it was over. It was decided to be over and to be very public on the first day of launch, um, which led to an interesting story. Uh, the organizational structure, there was an independent 501c3. It became a technically a sole source contractor with the Central Intelligence Agency. All the money had federal oversight through Congress, through the Appropriations Committee, showed up inside one of the CIA's line items. The money would flow either directly from CIA to us, uh, but basically with a lot of government oversight. And I'll explain why in a second. Let's go to the next slide here. Now, why even do this? Um, you know, in government, I, we had this joke at the CIA. And there's my, my first year in, I'm giving a speech to, uh, the, in the auditorium of the Central Intelligence Agency. There are 300 officers, intelligence officers in this room. Right? I'm standing, I'm giving this speech. And I'm talking about, you know, here's all the things that we learned about doing venture capital in Silicon Valley and all the technologies that were going to change the world, the internet, mobility, and all those kinds of things. Um, and then a young officer said, this, so what's, what's the one thing you've learned in your first year at CIA that you find rather unusual coming from Silicon Valley? So I said, you, you know, what's amazing is uh, if the director said, uh, if a terrorist opened up the door, threw a hand grenade in the room, every one of you would run, throw your body on the hand grenade. Right? You were willing to give your lives for all your fellow officers for, for the country, for the mission. But the director of Central Intelligence opened the door, ran in, shut the doors, and said, I need one of you guys to make a decision, right? And I need it right now. And if it's the wrong decision, it'll be the end of your career. All you guys will be running out the door. I never understood why you're willing to give your life, but not your careers, for the agency. And the young officer laughed. She said, uh, well, that's easy, because if I give my life, I don't have to live with it afterwards. <laughs> and that was just kind of a code word that to take a business risk as a government employee was to risk your career. And to, so for them to come up with this idea that we're going to do venture capital was the riskiest of riskiest missions, much more risky than running an op in the context of the CIA back in 1999. And this is the official mission, right? To identify, adopt, deliver innovative technology solutions to support the missions of the Central Intelligence Agency and then they added and broader US intelligence community. So it's a pretty straightforward mission. But the reason why the CIA thought it had to do this was the following reasons. They were really afraid of this, the digital Pearl Harbor. Digital Pearl Harbor is not some kid in the Philippines hacking away or some nation states trying to break into your computers and steal the information. Digital Pearl Harbor is having all the data but unable to assemble the data in time to warm up the threat. CIA was formed in 1947 based on reviewing what took place prior to the run-up of World War II. And what they realized was the US government had all the necessary data points necessary to warn of an attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. They had collections. They broke code purple. They, they were tracking what was going on in the embassies. They were tracking ship movements. They had all the pieces, but they were not able to assemble it in time because pieces of the information were, were buried in the Navy. The White House had certain pieces of information. The State Department had different pieces of information. So they created a Central Intelligence Agency to fix that problem. But in 1999, because the community got so good at collecting data, but not necessarily that good at processing all the data, that their biggest fear that there was going to be a new attack somewhere in the world, maybe even on the mainland. And in inspection, they would find 
that we had all the data necessary to warn of the attack. So director of CIA uh, had a meeting with the head of S&T. S&T is a science and technology director. The first meeting took place underneath Director Deutsch. And at the time, this uh, person by the name of uh, uh, Ruth David, who ran the S&T mission inside the agency, said, I think we need to come up with a different way to engage with the technology providers. And, and the technology providers that would prevent this attack probably does not live in defense contractors, the historical place that we go to buy really cool stuff spy gear, data processing, IT. It, it doesn't live in places like Lockheed Martin, SAIC, and Booz Allen. It lives in places like Yahoo. It lives in places like the kid at Stanford working on the next new search technology. It lives in places like in places like Berkeley where the kid's working on the next new math models. It's in every place but the places that we go to. And quite frankly, we have no access to those companies or those entrepreneurs. And we don't even know how to speak their language. We show up with a government contract and a federal acquisition document, the FAR is a document, 1,651 pages in you know, eight point font type on toilet paper, thick paper that's that thick, that's all the rules necessary for you to understand how to engage and get a contract from the US government, right? That is never going to happen in Silicon Valley. So we need a new model. So they send a team out to the West Coast. They met with Klein and Perkins um, and a few other venture funds. They also went up to uh, Washington State and met with another venture fund. They all said the same thing, which is if you want to engage high tech companies, then you need a vehicle that looks like things that we use, not things that you use to engage with it. And that's called investment, equity investments. So they went off and they recruited me. I came from Haswell, but that's a different story, not important for this conversation. But when I sat down with them, I just said, you know, they, they gave me a list of stuff. What, what happened was the director of central intelligence had an interview with the Washington Post about this idea of creating this new entity that would engage with Silicon Valley. It was called, oh, at that time, Peleus. That's the code name for Incutel at that time. Um, the idea was we we're going to create this technical switching station. So we would have technologies coming from Silicon Valley and the switching station. These group of uh, nonprofit folks would look at it, you know, team with contractors of the U.S. government, the defense contractors, give out a contract. We'll redact all the rules down to make it sort of easy, sort of commercial. Uh, kind of like a research grant, like NSF, and then they would transfer the technology to the CIA. And, and I looked at this thing. They actually had a business plan written like this. And I looked at this thing, and I go, I said, guys, you know, 80% of the words on this paper nobody even understands, right? It's beltway jargon. It's very easy to engage with Silicon Valley companies. It's called venture capital. Let's do what Intel does, or an Oracle, or half a dozen other strategic funds. Hit your wagon to the valley, create a strategic venture fund. The VCs, be, be good at something for the, for the VCs. Sorry, I, I got to, this will start ringing a lot. This is what happens when you're a venture capitalist. Everybody wants to call, right, when you don't want them to call. Probably, it's probably the NSA. But anyway, that's, different. That, that's an, an, again, another different subject. So, so by creating a venture capital, make it a strategic venture capital organization. And the only thing you have to do is provide some, a little bit of dumb money. You don't like that word, but you know, inside Silicon Valley, it means something. A little bit of dumb money and some level of expertise and access. Now, there's access to the federal marketplace in a way that doesn't require you to understand the FAR. And second, a vehicle to do investments so you can strategically grow these companies um, using a common vehicle, which is side-by-side -side investing. And your value-added proposition for the CIA is just tell the VC firms what's good stuff, right? Because just think about it. 
maybe I can't tell you who I give the box to, but I am now InQtel. And you show up, and you make the claim that you had the world's best firewall. Nothing can break through this firewall. So you, VC calls me up and goes, oh, God, you know, I got this great company. It looks really, really terrific. You know, great entrepreneur. It's building a next-gen firewall. Can you uh, sit down, uh, meet with the guys, and take a look at their box, and tell us what you think? So we meet with you. You, you know, we poke around in the box. The box disappears for a couple days. We come back, call up the VC, and say, you know, we think we'd take a pass on this deal. They say, thanks. How about this other company? So we became clearly the vetting house, the technology vetting house, and that was the value proposition. So that all sounds great, and we had all these goals. But we also had a lot of challenges. So as soon as we established ThinkUtel, within minutes, the appropriators at Congress said, time out. We don't even, one of the staffers said, we don't even know if this thing is legal, right? Show us the rules that says doing venture capital is a, is a non-prohibitive activity of the US government. Now, it is the Central Intelligence Agency, which makes it even worse because nobody in Congress actually trusts the CIA. And there's good reason for that, right? I mean, the CIA has a long history. Its job is to basically get other people to uh, act against their country's will on behalf of our country and you know, use lots of deceptive techniques to get information to do intelligence. So naturally, people are going to be suspicious of the CIA. Congress particularly was suspicious of the CIA, even if George was a staffer in this past. So the first question was, was it legal? And this smells really fishy. An independent 501c3? If this was so important, why isn't this a department within the agency? And venture capital, well, you know, we have contracts. We have small business loans. We have all these special programs. Sounds like market manipulation to us. And my God, the idea the CIA is going to roam around Silicon Valley, and some kid with you know, sandals and shorts is going to walk in the CIA versus walking in a Kleiner or Excel or Sequoia. It's just totally nutty. Um, the defense contractors didn't like it because my God, if these guys are successful and these Silicon Valley companies actually start producing technologies, people will stop writing us contracts. That's a loss of revenue. And then inside the CIA, but they had to fund this. They had to give, you know, they had to, you know, the first year it was publicly disclosed that they're going to fund this for $30 million. So inside the agency, they said, particularly the director of operations, that's my $30 million, those guys from the West Coast that stole out of my budget. Right? And so we are going to make sure they fail so we can get our budget back. That was the psychology of the guys on the inside. And this is my favorite term. What about catastrophic success? They were really worried that we would, we would invest in a company that made billions of dollars. And that would be a disaster. Right? Because when government invests, it's code word for spending a lot of money. You're not supposed to get any money back. What's going to happen when all that money comes back? But well, we know if money comes back with this particular agency, you know, it's called a slush fund. You know what happens in places all around the world where you have excess cash? They did not want to have that take place. So these are all the challenges. So on my first day on the job, I go to the CIA and do this. The second day on the job, I've been notified that the House Appropriation Committee is going to launch an investigation on the legal entity that was constructed. So they had their whole team of folks who showed up in our offices to go through for the six months to figure out a bunch of lawyers whether this was legal or not. So the CIA had to protect itself. The way the CIA protects itself is has its own independent inspector general's office launch a simultaneous investigation to make sure that us, the, the independent 501c3, was in compliance with the law. Then there was a third organization, Business Executives for National Security. 
Now, they got introduced because the friends of George Tenet inside the Congress said, well, we need an action that would block anything that the appropriator communities, because the way it works is it's the HIPSI and SISI, which are the oversight committees. And then there's the appropriating committees who have all the money. So the HIPSI and SISI kind of liked the idea. The appropriators kind of didn't like the idea. So the HIPSI commissioned a third party organization to launch their study. So in the first six months, we had more inspectors in our office than we had employees, right? I mean, two thirds of our office were filled with people and lawyers trying to figure out whether or not this thing should even exist. We were very fortunate that the Inspector General's office and the Business Executives for National Security wrote in both their independent reports that this is a risk worth taking and there should be no further investigations for the next five years. We should just let them run with it. If they fail, they fail. If they're successful, we'll deal with it. And that was our green light to get going. And he provided the necessary set of rules in which we could operate like a venture capital fund. So the first few years we were kind of a curiosity. People came to InQtel to, you know, you know, quite frankly, get cool CIA golf balls, CIA t-shirts, because you would provide that to the VCs. If you helped us out, showed us a deal, we might give you a leather jacket that you know we would go down to the gift store. It had some really cool logos on it. Um, and there were some people who were honestly interested in, you know, kind of experimenting with the models on the venture side. So there were lots of friends. Uh, friendly organization that thought that this was a pretty interesting mission. Larry Ellison at Oracle, uh, basically off of what, right after a race in one of his World Cup races, uh, picked up the phone and said, uh, sat phone and said, just to let you know, we heard about you, anything we could do to help you guys out, let us know. And the reason for that was CIA was Larry's very first customer in Project Oracle. That became Oracle. Kleiner, of course, they instantly were helpful because they were the ones who recommended it. And I was actually, I was a Kleiner kid, Kleiner kid being a former Kleiner uh, entrepreneur. And so we began to get some level of traction, but it wasn't until 9-11 that everything completely turned. It turned really from an experiment into a real operation within the community. 9-11 was proof that the digital Pearl Harbor did exist and all the things that they were worried about came true in 9-11. It also, in the Valley, um, it was very difficult for Silicon Valley executives and investors and venture capitalists to be able to participate in the, you know, the, the days following 9-11 and to show that we can be a part of the solution. And so Inkytel happened to be at the right place at the right time and suddenly the Valley just completely opened up the doors, right, because it, it was, you know, what can we do to prevent this from happening again? Um, what was also interesting is that inside the agency, uh, the attitudes turned very, very quickly. Because it wasn't now about turf wars. It was really about finding a real war and a real mission. And so everybody kind of laid down their, you know, you know, the rocks and said, OK, how do we fit in this technology to solve these classes of problems. And we came up with some amazing companies. Um, in the opening days of 9-11, uh, right after 9-11, as we were prosecuting the fight, one of the first companies that hit the ground running in Afghanistan was a little company called Kehoe. And Kehoe was the satellite mapping software that allowed any analyst or anybody in the field with a laptop computer to access global maps. and that few later, years later was acquired by Google. It's now called Google Maps and Google Earth, right? Um, technology that found non-obvious relationships between individuals. It was a company that was solving the problem in casinos of how to identify customers as they're walking into the casino to see if there's any relationship between that customer and anybody who works at that casino, namely the gambling table. Because if there's a collusive relationship, typically what would happen is if there's a sting on, that casino would lose upwards of $2 million in one night on one sting. So 
the thing about the gambling rules is if you catch the person while they're inside the casino, you get your money back. The casino gets its money back. The person steps out of the casino, the money gets go goes to the gaming commission. So there's lots of incentives to finding real-time relationships. So we made that an investment. 9-11 happens. 9-14, CEO of that company who's driven all the way from Las Vegas. Remember, there were no planes flying. <laughs> Took a few days to get there. We're sitting down at FBI applying that software to catch people who cheat at gambling casinos to find relationships between people who were involved in 9-11 in any prior activities. And there's a guy by the name of Jeff Jonas who never finished high school. Using his software, figured out that we had all the information to prevent 9-11 because if they went back to the original bombing of the Twin Towers. Remember, there was a, a bombing beforehand where they were trying to blow up the basement, the foundation. And it caused a lot of fires, but you know, the buildings did not collapse. Turns out there were bench warrants for individuals and that they had run the data analysis of those individuals in the bench warrants. They would have identified something like 19 of the 22 individuals involved in 9-11 in because they all used common phone numbers. They used common frequent flyer numbers. They had common addresses. And none of this, they, the agency was able to piece together to Jeff said, look, if you just run this data with the bench warrant data and credit card and frequent flyer mile data, you could find everybody who was involved. Um, so 9-11 was a big turning point. And the results were rather spectacular, right? As of today, Inkytown now represents seven intelligence agencies, much more than just the CIA. They invested in more than 200 startups. 70% of the companies they invest in ended up doing business beyond the CIA and follow-on businesses. Created companies like Palantir. Uh, as I said earlier, Google Earth, Google Maps. Uh, ArcSight, which was bought by HP for $1.4 billion. And it had, you know, company after company, uh, FireEye, Cloudera, uh, of, of the companies that was on the back of your case study, two-thirds of those companies were either bought, exist as a standalone company, or went public, which is an incredible, incredible number when you think about the batting average of a typical venture capital fund. And for every dollar Inkytown invested, it leveraged $9 of venture investment. But none of these first four points really matter. Because the mission of Inkytel wasn't to make money. Losing money was simply a proxy for choosing badly the companies. Making money was an offshoot of choosing the right companies. But the only real mission metric that mattered was whether or not any of this technology was used in mission activities that led to success. And I can't sit here and tell you what those missions were. But I would tell you some of the most highest profile successes of the United States intelligence community can be attributed to one or more Incutel technologies that was invested over the last 10 years. So remarkable outcome for Incutel, right? So let's kind of learn some of the lessons. I have a dozen quick lessons for strategic venture capital. It doesn't matter if you're the CIA, whether you're doing Google Ventures, or Intel Ventures, or Samsung calls you up to run their next venture fund. There are certain things that make a good strategic fund work, and there are certain things that are obvious mistakes that, at the end of the day, will provide no corporate value, no value to your shareholders or to your mission. So let's quickly go through those rules. Somebody once asked me, what was the secret to the success of Inkytel? You know, you, the typical tried answer is you've got great people and, you know, really smart investors and we got lucky. But the real thing, it turns out, was that Inkytel started with what we call the problem set. The CIA showed up and said, you know what, we're going to give a small percentage of you guys clearances. We don't want too many people having clearances at Inkytel because the moment you have a clearance, you can't talk to people and you have to live a kind of strange and weird life. So we want most of the people to be normal people going out there and speculating what we need, because speculation is good. Knowing sometimes is bad because you're not allowed to speculate.
But some of us, was given, we were given the agency specific problems of here's all the things that we wish we had inside the CIA. And if you could solve these problems, we can move forward on the mission. And it was interesting that a lot of the stuff in the problems that looked a lot like the technology that's used on 24 or covert affair. Turns out that Hollywood, you know, every time you kind of go through and, and there's this, well, you know, I got this cell phone and I do this little trick on the map and then it figures out that who, this person on the other end is a bad guy uh, to the facial recognition stuff where it goes through and this, all the flipping through the face to the thing that decrypts. Almost that list looked identical to all the stuff that was being used in Hollywood. But that problem set was critical because it said was we were not investing in technology. We were investing in solutions. And the CIA was a power user. And by being a power user, they ran into problems ahead of the market. So the, the satellite company that now is Google Earth, Google Maps, every venture capitalist turned that deal down. They said, it's pretty, but there's no business model here, right? Who wants to you know, fly over to Earth and look at 3D maps? You know, nobody really wants this stuff, right? Wrong, <laughs> right? Palantir. I had a venture fund call me up and said, Peter Thiel, we really, really like, and you know, he's a big time dude, and he did PayPal, and we made a lot of money off of him. But he's talking about using algorithms for PayPal to solve terrorist things, and we don't even know what Peter's talking about. And we don't want to do that deal, but we want to keep the relationship. Can you please meet with him? And if you, and if you can just do something with them so we can preserve the relationship? Palantir today is worth $9 billion, $9 billion, right? And it's solving not just government problems, but most of the financial community is using Palantir today. So, so CIA's problems were more valuable than the technologies. And by going after solutions that solved their problems were a predictor of what the market was going to need. And that's true for almost all corporate entities. The mistake that most corporate entities make when they start a venture organization is because they think they wanted to swim in the valley. I know that's a mixed metaphor, but uh, they just want to you know, breathe the air, meet the folks, the kids at Stanford, hang around you know, Silicon Valley, eat at the Quadras, you know, go down university, thinking that if they suddenly put an outpost out here, that they're going to get the mojo, and suddenly they'll become innovative. It turns out not to be the case. Don't do strategic adventuring unless you have a strategy of why you're going to do it in the first place. The best thing to do is, why can't you solve these problems using your current methods of productions of technologies, either your contracts, your in-house development organizations? In some cases, the very best strategic funds use the strategic funds to poke at their own internal organizations, to disrupt the inside who basically got lazy and started just iterating off of yesterday's technologies rather than coming up with something that was truly disruptive. Next thing, every fund needs a mission. It's not just to have a mission statement. But if you, don't, if you can't articulate what your mission is, why you exist, everyone who worked at Incatital understood why they exist. They understood what they were looking for and why it related directly to the mission of the CIA, right? And if you didn't like the mission of the CIA, you wouldn't be there. It wasn't about, you know, I couldn't get a job at Kleiner, so I took the job at InQtel, right? This was, let me put it this way. My life was really strange. Half my time, every other week, I would run around Silicon Valley and the other half of the week, I ran around Langley and other related places that the agency had relationships with. That's a nice way of saying places I can't tell you about. The reason for that was the director of CIA said, Gilman, your overt mission is go find tech. Your covert mission is I need you to help transform this place inside the CIA to give our young officers hope that we can be modern, that we can think out of the box, that we can be like Q in the movie James Bond. Notice this, in Q tell, <laughs> right? In, in fact, Q, the actor, actually signed his autograph the week before he died. I had nothing to do with his death, it was a car accident. But, but, 
that's a true story. <laughs> uh, but Q was, you know, our inspiration. We were all Qs. We were out there pounding away. And the agency inside, that transformation was we could do anything, right? It was sort of like what we wanted to do was to put that inspirational entrepreneurial spirit that was out here and put it back inside the agency and that they could see, if a young officer could see all the stuff we were doing in Silicon Valley, they said, well, but we can take, do the same stuff in Cairo and we can do the same things in Bangalore and we can do the same things in Beijing or Moscow, wherever else the agency had to operate, was it, we became a can-do spirit in the darkest of times of the CIA. Make the CEO the number one supporter. Anybody starting a venture strategic fund that doesn't have the person at the very top 100% bought in is going to fail. Because there are too many senior VPs who want you out of the way. At CIA, the corollaries to the senior VPs were the directorates, the deputy directors. And the only thing that protected us was that if you tried to stomp on us, you were in the director's office the next day. And it only took a couple of weeks of officers who were 20 years of experience, very senior, showing up in the office with Buzzy Krongard, <coughs> right? And the director of CIA said, how much do you value your career? F for that word to spread to say, stop stomping on Incutel. But if you did not have that top support, you would be immediately relegated to, as the Japanese say, the corner office, the glass window. It would be the dumping grounds of all the VPs who couldn't execute his or her mission. It would be all the line managers who failed in their product designs. It's all the people who dislike being at the company who would complain. You put them all into the strategic venture arm of the organization, and then you let it die. And that's what happens in a lot of these places. So CEO support is critical. Another mistake is, you're going, whenever you start something new inside a, an existing large enterprise, you're going to have the naysayers. And the naysayers are really smart, right? So, so in any organization, you got smart people, and you got people who are just trying to survive, and you got dumb people. You don't have to worry about the dummies. They're, you know, nobody listens to them. But in anything that's revolutionary, you typically get 51% of the people supporting something that's revolutionary and 49% of the people who say, we shouldn't do that because it's too risky. And the 49% has a very strong following because the esprit de corps of an organization, the history of the organization, the things that, that they would point to of all their prior success typically lives in that 49%. This is the mission. We've always done this mission this way. We were successful in the past. Why change now? Right? And they had the most history of success. They're, they're, the, they're the heroes of the enterprise in many cases. They're not the, you know, I'm the bureaucrat who, you know, everybody hates and nobody talks to. They're the most passionate at what they're doing. And they're very good at tying you up in knots. And so when I showed up, the naysayers tried to hijack InQtel. The first thing they tried to do was, we have this board of experts inside CFIA, and we want the board of experts to approve all the deals before you go off and do the deal. And I go, you guys are pretty smart. You guys are really smart. But last time I checked, none of you guys could even spell the word venture capital. Look, you guys are great at mission, right? Uh, and then, it's, then their second argument was, OK, we agree. We're not good at venture capital, so we should have a study. Study is code word for stall. Stall until you die. And, so, and inside CIA, you want to stall for about f two to four years, because at that time, the, the, there'll be a new director of central intelligence. <laughs> right? You just wait out. We call it waiting out the seventh floor. So when you go in and you start a new organization, or you can create something that's disrupted, that it will be the smartest people in the enterprise who, as soon as they say the word, we should study this, run for the hills. It was really interesting. I had one officer call me up to a completely different city. And, he, and he, you know, later on, he became uh, the head of intelligence for NYPD. 
He was the former deputy director of intelligence, former deputy director of analytics, very senior officer. And uh, he said, well, you know, I heard a lot about InQtel, and we're really excited. We want to support you guys out here in the field. And here's the list. He gives me this list. I'm looking at this list. I said, there's a bunch of names on this list. He goes, uh, he goes yeah, they're all at the agency. I said, do you want, should I, like, contact these? You know, like, contact you? He goes, these are the people you need to avoid, <laughs> right? So this is really important. It's more important to have the list of the people to avoid in the enterprise that you are working with than the people who are going to be your advocates. <laughs> you need to know who your enemies are. <laughs> it's a very far away, right? So avoid the internal naysayers. Don't try to spend all your energies to convince them because the only thing that's going to convince them is success. And the only way you can prove success is to do it. And if you're successful, you'll eventually turn them around your way. And if you failed, you failed on your own bad ideas. So you're not going to win them over. Prosecute your mission. Avoid the naysayers. Develop a world-class board. The board has to be independent of the enterprise, with exception of maybe one or two people on your advisory board. So Inkytel had this amazing board. It had the former chairman of Lockheed Martin, the former chairman of Goldman Sachs, the former deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, right? They had the, the, the head of, uh, the former head of Xerox Park, the former head of uh, Bell Labs. They had this incredible group of people, former deputy uh, the former Secretary of Defense, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense. What was interesting about this board, they were half Republicans, half Democrats, is that the, the director is so smart. What he quickly figured out is that if I put together this all-star board, particularly from people who at, at the end of somebody's careers you see in, in government, when you retire, you're still relatively young. So you, you, you do your service for your country, live kind of crappy wages, kind of miserable bureaucracy. You do your mission. You execute that mission, and then you trade it in. Afterwards, you get a pension, a retirement, and then you go work for a contractor. Right? Big defense companies is kind of typically what happens. And then you make two salaries. Well, all these guys run the places that you're going to end up working for. So you're not going to want to like stomp all over Bill Perry who's also on the board of Boeing. You're not going to take on Norm Augustine, who runs Lockheed Martin. You kind of say, you know, sure, that was a great idea. Let's look into it, right? That's about as, as, as much adversarial relationship you want to have with that board. The test of a good board is when the CEO shows up, and do they sit around, right, start talking about old stories? If they do, you got the best board. The CEO walks in and, and looks around and doesn't know anybody from anyone then you're really, really in bad shape. That world-class board is your protector that protects you from the organisms within the enterprise who want to seek your destruction. But they also provide you the wisdom that prevents you from making stupid mistakes because they've been there for 20 or 30 years in one form or another. They know where all the skeletons are buried. They can tell any naysayer how they were able to solve the problem. So they become your best advocates and defenders. And many venture funds, strategic funds, make the mistake of not putting together a strong advisory board. And do not populate your advisory boards with anybody currently in operational positions within the enterprise. Because those people will become competitors to your resource in the resource fight of allocations. Insiders and invest investors and insiders. So, a lot of funds are people from corp dev offices who are frustrated in corporate development and they want to go off and run a venture group. So they create a venture group. That is not the right group of people you want to be leading up a strategic venture fund inside a corporation. You need professional investors, people who do this for a living, who know how to invest. Right? You need real VCs, not wannabe VCs. Right. They could be young. In many cases, uh, in Qtel, we had, a, you know, we had some experienced 
folks who have been involved in venture capital. And we had a bunch of kids from Stanford who kind of grew up here that we hired literally right out of the school that everybody liked, that everybody, all the, you know, all the funds wanted to fund them. We convinced them to actually serve this stent with us at InQtel, and they became some of our best performers, right? It's really interesting. Years later, 10 years after they left InQtel, all of them now are millionaires, very successful entrepreneurs, right? Because they understood how to execute venture capital. And, and so we had a team of experienced people and a, a team of people who understood the technologies at a deep, profoundly, uh, unusual level to actually have insight what the market was going to want. Now that's obvious. Uh, what's not so obvious is you need an equal team of insiders who are people inside the corporation handpicked typically by somebody very much trusted by the CEO who are all the movers and shakers, kind of the, what we had is these uh, mid-level officers who knew all the ins and outs of the building. And they were told that if they were successful in prosecuting this mission, they would make the senior ranks. It's sort of like, think of it as directors on their ways to VPs, right? Um, and their job was to advocate inside the enterprise. They were to find places inside the enterprise who would sponsor new technologies and actually use the technologies that we were investing in and also help us with avoiding the naysayers at the same time. At Incutel, that group was called the Quick, and they were initially formed by some of the best young officers the agency had, officers like the procurement officer, from the general counsel's office, all the folks who could get in your way, the, the security people, all were insiders, because the, inside the CIA, if a security guy says, you can't do that, it's not gonna happen. The counterintelligence officer says, we can't put that technology in the building because it's a threat, it's not going to happen. If the general counsel's office says, this is not legal or you have to prove to us why it's legal, it's not going to happen. So again, they handpicked individuals who knew those rules inside and out and could make anything happen in the building. Solution transfer, look, it's not just about the money to invest. It's also by putting a pot aside of money that helps the operational units use the technology in the operations. You can't go into an operating manager and say, hey, I got this grand new, you know, this new magical technology. Can you try it out and tell me if it's going to work? You know, she's going to say, look, my job doesn't depend on proving this works. I got, I'm busy, right? I got to make my budget. I got to make my numbers. You know, I got my program. So unless you resource it, usually with money, where the organization from within says, boy, there's a big old pot of money over there. I can hijack some of that money and some of that talent, right? Um, I can get extra resources. So what we did was we used this transfer bucket as a way to fund organizations from within the enterprise to take the risks, to try out new technology and actually use it and give us feedback. But it had to come with people and it had to come with money. And your measure of impact has to be on corporate mission. So your mission as the venture fund has to be directly related to the corporate mission. And if you can't prove why investing in the company or getting a technology spun out or implementing a new product line is going to help the corporate mission, then what the hell are you doing? And a lot of people think, well, you know, we're making money. Well, no, the stockholders didn't give you their profits for you to invest on their behalf. If you're General Motors, you're supposed to be building cars. If you want to do a venture fund that makes better cars, that you can point to making innovative cars, go for it. But if you're simply saying, well, I can add to the bottom line, give the money back to the shareholders, we can invest it for ourselves. And you have to develop clear metrics of success. And this is not a 32 item list. So this is kind of funny. George Tenn and I were sitting around with Buzzy and we said, okay, well, Congress is gonna be up our tail, even though we got a, a, a buy for this week. They're gonna say, where's your metrics for success? Right? Our staff is gonna say, what do we do? How do we know we're successful? And it has to be simple. 
It can't be, you know, I, I can't have an MBA, need an MBA to figure out what this list says. So we came up with three numbers. And every year, we just moved those numbers to larger versions of those numbers. First number was, how many deals did you do? Right? Because if you're not doing deals, you're not being active, and you're not engaging. Sort of like sales calls. You know, any of the, have you ever watched Tin Man or Glenn Gary and Ross or any of those classic shows, right? It's like, where's your call list? You got to have a call list. So how many deals did you do? How many technologies did, of those deals got piloted within the agency? Piloted means that you have successfully engaged with somebody in the building or in the community that is actually willing to test the technology out. And the last measure of success was simply how many technologies are now incorporated now, fully integrated into the mission. And those three numbers exist today. They can point back to the day we started in Intel and show the progressive march of those three numbers. That were the only three numbers. It wasn't IRR. It wasn't you know, how many top tier venture funds you could do deals with. It wasn't how many IPOs you had. It was those three simple measures. Because if we got to the bottom one, where it was integrated into mission, mission success would come. And when success comes out of the mission, you can point back to the technology. So it needs to be simple. And I say no more than three measures of success. And it has to be the same three measures for a prolonged period of time. Be a disciplined investor. And this is really important because what happens is you get these calls. Hey, look, you know, Joe has a really good technology over here. We really, really need it. You know, it has no commercial application. We don't have any budget for it. You got a pot of money. Why don't you guys fund it? It's really easy to say yes. Or it's really easy to take away your commercial companies and put in that one feature your corporate guys want to have in it that has no value. A total distraction for the company. And the whole point of the exercise is we want to create commercial companies because commercial companies will self-finance their innovation going forward if we're successful in creating those new enterprises. So let's not invest in a bunch of dogs. Somebody asked Bill Perry, somebody from Congress, said, Bill, do you think that uh, you know, profits are an important measure? He goes, well, it's not part of the metrics. But let's put it this way. If Inkitown makes a bunch of investments, and they all lose money. It's not a perfect measure, but they probably chose all the wrong companies. And then we would have all the bad stuff that nobody else wants in our buildings, and we're going to have to support it. If they're successful, and these companies go public, or big public companies buy them, they're going to be integrated into the infrastructure. And then from that point on, whenever we need another version of it, we don't have to write a check for innovation because the company will self-fund that innovation. So you have to be a disciplined investor and avoid the temptation of doing deals simply to make somebody in your building happy. You need to be an agent of change. The reason why you have a strategic venture capital fund at the end of the day is because nobody on the inside can do it. If they could have done it on the inside, they wouldn't need you in the first place. So you have to be willing to be an agent of change, and you've got to advocate for change. You've got to be smart about how you do it, you can't be stomping on everybody, telling how dumb everybody else is. But you got to be a proactive agent who goes out and saying, you're an enabler. You want to take the enterprise at any level, a new employee, a VP, a manager, a director, a programmer, and say, look, you got a great idea. And, and, and somebody should do this. And I know you don't have any time. Let me take that idea. Why don't you talk to one of these companies that, that's working on, on something very similar and implant that idea, and we can get this thing going and make them a part of the solution, make them part of the enterprise. And Google, I would say, of all the venture funds recently created, the best group that does that is Google Ventures. Google Ventures use their employee base to augment the companies that they invest in, and they use the companies that they invest in to motivate the people who are already employees at Google. Right? So if you have a question about marketing and advertising 
you know, the ad group will come in and have a discussion with you and give you some strategies. If you have an issue around search engine or computer science problems, some PhD from Google from another lab would show up in your office and start talking to you about how to solve it. And look how successful Google Ventures has been, in, and it's only been around for like three or four years. Take risks and be disruptive. This is also equally important. There is a temptation to avoid taking risks. Now, the government funds are the worst place, right? You don't want to have a cylindra. If you have a cylindra, it's not just the end of your venture fund. It's probably the end of the director, as we know from the director, of, uh, secretary of, of energy. Um, you got to take measured risks. And you have to play in the government the failures you have to write the headlines in the Washington Post and the New York Times. You say, if this thing fails, what will they report on? How will they spin it? And you got to be able to be prepared for those kinds of failures. But at the end of the day, if you don't take those risks to do those deals, you can't be transformative. Your job is to take the outside risk that the corporate enterprise is not willing to take out of their line, product lines, or out of their mainline businesses. And you have to disrupt. You have to be willing to step on your own line manager's businesses. Why is that important? A lot of people say, you know, if we, if we invest in this company, this company is competitive with us. My argument is they're going to be competitive with us anyway. At least if we're on the inside, we can learn something from them. And if they're successful, we just buy them, right? But there is this, always this temptation of, oh, we could do it better ourselves. Or, yeah, we thought of that four years ago, so, so you shouldn't do it. Or, yeah, this is great, but you know, this would destroy one of our businesses. So we should go out of our way to make sure they're not successful. That's just wrong thinking, right? Because if one engineer can think it, another engineer can think it. So you better get in bed with the engineer that you can work with so that you can get there ahead of your competitors. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.